there will always be record collectors. Absolutely, there will always be record collectors. You cannot put into words the feelings that you get from having your own vinyl collection. Uh, Ross Smith is a record collector. Well, he's the ultimate record collector. He must have about three million records in his shop. Right, well, I got into collecting records uh, early in 1967, very, very early 1967. Well, that's when I realised I'd got soul in me, and this was a, you know, that was a choice of music. Memories of music. Uh, my mum actually singing along to radio. We always had a record player in the house, and my dad were a typical Irishman. He liked to drink and he liked to smoke. He had a little part time job behind bar at local pub. He were very friendly with landlord. And we used to go and stay there when he went on holiday. And on odd occasions when we were there, they'd change the records in the jukebox. I've still got some of those records in my collection today. The odd Tamla Motown one, Spencer Davis and Dusty Springfield. You got given them as you know, free gratis, like that. And I suppose that's really why I started actually collecting records. I suddenly got this urge of interest. Well, I bought these magazines by chance. I think I bought one or two more magazines after that. And then eventually, in March 67, I bought my first record player. I bought a couple of second hand records from the same shop to start me off. And then I started got very obsessed from then really. I was just taking a newspaper around in those days. And I just started going to the second hand shops just outside Nottingham on the, in the suburbs, such as Radford. And every Saturday spending any money I could afford on records. I uh, first went to record collecting about 1974, uh, just after Wiggins started up, and uh, there were some mods on our street when we lived at Onward, and my friend Mark, uh, we was um, adult gear on in State Press and Crombies, and they said, would you like to come with us on back at Scooters, because they were mods to go to this, like, disco it were, and we went there, and they were playing this music and I asked the lad what it was and he says it's soul music so there was like flyers on tables and we looked at them and it says Samantha's on it and that so we decided to go and it was an all-nighter and that's what got me into Northern Soul and my first records is when I bought it was down at the Wigan Casino you were dancing and you had the record and you're thinking what's this called because you didn't know no, at uh, our only 17 and you know none on the records so there was a record bar at the back and we went in and he said do you know what this record was were played before this one and the guy who we went up to says yeah it's so and so by so and so and we um, I said have you got it he goes yeah and uh, he said I've got it on this label and I says, oh, how much is it? He says, oh, it's a pound. So uh, it was called Out on the Floor, Don't Be Gay. And charges, so I paid a pound for it. It happened in a few ways, actually. Uh, a bit by love of soul music and a bit by accident, I suppose. I can remember going to, uh, they used to have a disco at North Winfield Manor's Welfare on a Thursday night. 
But uh, half at music, what they were playing, I, di I didn't recognise it, you know what I mean? I only recognised the Motown bits on it, but there was something else like, with this more, you know, up-tempo beat, and I thought, that's that's even better, that, you know what I mean? That's the one I'm trying to find. But anyway, at that time, I'd be about nine years old, and I used to try and uh, sneak in without paying ten pence for back doors all the time, because I only lived six doors from the building. And anyway, I got quite friendly with DJ, because I used to help him carry half his stuff in and all that. And anyway, he says to me one night, middle of a Thursday night disco, he says, oh, do us a favour. He says, I'm going to the toilet. He says, can you just press that button there, and that button there, and it'll start that one. So as soon as he got, I had a look at what next record where he queued, what he got queued up. And it was something, I can't remember, something like Nazareth or something like that, and I thought, I ain't, I ain't that shy. On. You know what I mean? So I whipped it off right quick. And in actual fact, I, I put a pop record on, but there were a lot of soulful pop records in them days. And the one I picked out, I'll never forget it, is You Little Trust Maker by The Times. So I, I spun my first record there when I went on, and that was a record. Like, But that's when I realised I'd got soul in me. And it, this was, a, you know, that was the choice of music. But when I heard all this other stuff that were coming out, I mean, you're talking like, Wigan were just kicking off then, and, when you had stuff like velvet satin, velvet satins, nothing can compare to you. They were so powerful. They just, you know, you just wash over and you just grab you. And that's when I realised that was the music for me. <clears throat> the record collecting. That that also, I suppose, happened by accident as well, because it was same age again, nine. Graham Weaver, a good friend of mine. They'd knocked a lot of houses down in Homewood and they'd moved them down to North Wingfield, built this new estate for them. But Graham come down there and that's when I got to know him. And he were into this salsa flat, so I just, because he was a lot older than me, I just grabbed onto his tail, you know what I mean, his coat, and uh, basically whatever Graham said, like, that were gospel to me, like, he were learning me, me tricks at trade and all that, what were an original record, what were a pressing. It's hard when you're that age to fabric it all that. And the records, they wasn't available in them days like they are now with Web and all that. And I can remember like most of this first collection I got together, it was just a small box, like everybody had one. And they were mainly 90% of them were like what they call pressings or reissues. Uh, I think everybody started like that. Then you, once you got to know that, you got rid of them and moved on to proper stuff. I suppose I always loved music, but I really got into collecting music when uh, I used to go to Heath uh, Youth Club, which was held at the school at the time. I'm going back to, I don't know, between 65 and 68, something like that, at that time. And um, I started buying LPs to start with rather than singles. And I think the first LP I ever bought was probably the Four Tops' first LP. And then I started buying the Motown albums, which were a collection of a bit like Motown Review, they were called. I mean, at the time, and I was following it closely, at the time, in America, what you had is these Motown Reviews, they all used to throw themselves onto a bus and literally tour America with a whole Motown show. And the spin-off from that was all the Motown records that they made. And initially, I started with the albums, and then what you'd do is, if there was a particular band that you liked, you'd start picking up on the actual singles for them. But I have to say, even back then, my records tastes were really eclectic because I used to buy the Rolling Stones and Beatles as well and and other stuff that was in the charts but primarily the music that I bought was soul music and it didn't matter what what soul bag you put it in if it was soul and it sounded good I used to buy it I still like my music today I can escape into it I can't say what feeling it gives me it spells it in a way it's an adrenaline rush I never really progressed to CDs I still like my vinyl collection even if I don't play them I can sit and get a few of them out and clean them and look at them they fascinate me and I've got a lot of good memories regarding music I haven't got really any bad ones 
you think you've got every record that you want and you, you're just about to relax and then bang another one comes out of nowhere from you know what I mean you think you've heard them all and you just I've got to have that you know what I mean you've got to have it do not matter how much it because I've got to have it John Manship hit now like had a few years back when he started doing his books he said it's the dearest hobby anybody could ever have but it's also most frustrating as well the unavailability of the records gives it that uniqueness. You know, the more unavailable they are, the better it is. It's the rarity what keeps it special. Um, I used to play them at home first on my record player, and then everybody started uh, setting up these soul venues once a month. And uh, the first one I DJed at was. Pilsley and uh, Chris Cooper says would you like to be a resident DJ there so I uh, started playing there with uh, Ian G, Chris Cooper, Barry Cooper and then other venues started popping up. My mate uh, Keith Morton he set up the YMCA I was a resident DJ there with Mark Mahoney and uh, himself and we was uh, DJing there I like to play the 60s records and uh, that shut down that now, nowadays I get Bridlington Weekender, Scarborough Weekender DJing, I've been up as far as Durham, I've been down as far as Inkley, I've been to Wales but not DJing to a Weekender at Prestatin, I've been to Manchester to Presswich, I've been to North Ollerton, my Red Lerons is Egbra, Soul Night, and I get DJing spots there, and uh, at that one I can play across the board. Uh, my current DJing position is the Groveton Rooms, and I'm resident DJ there, but we uh, only play oldies only, and we get about 450 people in. The main brainchild was, I'm not giving myself any credit for it, but what I did, I had my Northern Soul here, because I got about four co crates of Northern Soul, which I sold at gigs by that time. But the main brainchild was, I had this idea to sell Golden Oldies, because I still had a great love of pop music, as I always will have. And so I started going out and about and paying a guy to drive me around, and well, he would have the records as well, so it was a kind of joint thing. I was just buying records which I thought would sell, such as, uh, you know, decent golden oldies which you felt people wanted. And the idea became initially to have records that people heard on the radio or at a club and could buy them off me. Uh, so that was that. Anyway, let's put a cut a story short. My little bit of business started to grow a little bit, and I think they became the people that had the shop, they were. Their business was lowering a little bit and they had a lot of cost to pay out, so they offered me the lease on the shop. Which, because uh, I wanted to get rid of it, I believe, so uh, eventually it took a while to get the lease sorted out, but uh, I just took it over basically. And I was quite lucky in a way because I was only thinking about myself, I didn't have staff to pay. The interesting thing is, I never really considered that I got into DJing in the Northern Soul scene. What happened was, I used to go to discos as a young person on a regular basis every weekend um, because I loved dancing more than anything and I'd dance to anything uh, and I found that most of the DJs were not playing the stuff I wanted to listen to and in the end I just gave in and I thought this is no good at all I need to play I need to be a DJ and play the stuff that I like uh, and I know that a lot of other people liked it as well so I started back in 1968 and I started DJing at the Elm Tree at Eath and to be fair, it was a pretty mixed crowd that used to come in, and most of the music was chart stuff. But I used to do a soul top ten. So whatever the soul top ten was that week, I played it. But it was a real variation. I mean, even back then, Northern was only just starting to have a, a real impact. So in that soul top ten, you'd probably only have two or three that were Northern records. The rest would be, you know, sort of mainstream Motown, a bit of bit of funk, because a lot of funk was being played down south. South James Brown and Cool and the Gang, that sort of stuff. 
Uh, but that's how I got into it. That's how I sort of kicked off. And then as time went on, what happens is, because people know you play soul, then they ask you to come along to the soul venues and say, will you do a spot? It's the old thing, isn't it? You know, will you come along and do an hour? I don't know. I, I never thought I'd sell them, but you never know in 10 years' time. I'm 61. I'm like, like hanging on to death's door or something. What benefit will there be to me? Well, hopefully, Nova Soul scene will still be going then. And uh, my daughter might get some benefit from them, I don't know. I cannot say how much it means to me. And it will always be a passion, even if I don't play them. And I'm hoping one day that it's going to be passed down the generations of my family like it was to me with my parents influences by my elder brother and friends business and pleasure as I always say to people it's uh, it's what I do it's a crutch to for something to do with gigs as well really because I don't dance these days and uh, it just gives me some base to be at where I can plot my stuff and talk to people if they want to come and talk or look at records or uh, I normally give myself something to do as well if uh, I get a bit bored, like master bagging soul singles or doing a check on what I've got and things like that. So, um, yeah, some, some might think it's a bit boring, but it's uh, quite an enjoyable way of having a social life and doing a little bit of business as well. There's the uh, Wigan Casino with the artists on and new and DJs. This is another one from the Casino Club. As you can see, there's the DJs there, the crowd, the building, and the people below, record dealers, DJing, and all the people below who uh, run it. That's the DJs, manager, bouncers, and the ladies who took your money. And, uh, unfortunately, some of them's not alive anymore, the lady and some others, manager. But the two DJs in, Richard Serling and Russell Stanley, are still alive, playing the tunes still.